Hello, Kristen Calloway back talking about airway reconstruction post-operative care. So the goals for this talk are to go over post-operative care and management following complex airway reconstructive procedures. Um, we'll discuss um, how often you want to take your patients back for bronchoscopy to take a look at the, their progress. We'll look at um, complications um, as well as troubleshooting. So. For all types of airway reconstruction, um, that is single stage, this is 1.5 stage, this is double stage um, LTRs. This also applies for your slide patients um, or your tracheal resection patients. Everyone, first and foremost, needs an emergency airway plan, which is clearly communicated and documented. Um, this is especially important to communicate this to your um, pediatric ICU colleagues, um, as well as within surgery itself to your anesthesia colleagues, everyone needs, really needs to be on board. Postoperatively, all patients are placed on antibiotics, um, preferably this would be ampicillin and sulbactam, unless they're allergic, um, the common name for that is unison. Um, so the reason for that is you want to put them on antibiotics while the drains are in place, um, and usually the neck drain is in place for about one week, that's a foreign body. You want them on antibiotics, and regardless, um, if they were to have any sort of leak through their anastomosis, you would like them to be well covered. Um, secondly, our second line of defense is um, to place patients on anti-reflux medication for three months after surgery. So that helps keep um, inflammation down and keeping um, our sites happy where they're trying to heal. We find it useful to have stable access for these patients. Um, we prefer PICC lines, so these are peripheral um, IV lines that are placed in the, in the pediatric ICU um, postoperatively. Um, if those aren't available, um, central lines or whatever your, um, your institution prefers. All patients should get a postoperative chest x-ray to check for a pneumothor pneumothorax after a rib graft harvest, if they, were to, if they had a rib graft harvest. Um, we find chest x-rays to be helpful for placement of tubes um, and checking to make sure everything's in the right spot. Um, and finally, because all of our patients have had an open airway, um, we also recommend a bowel regimen in order to prevent straining um, and subsequent crepitus and air leak into the neck. For laryngotracheal reconstruction patients who are um, in a single stage or 1.5 stage, uh, plan. They come to the unit nasotracheally intubated. So the number one issue with this is that you need to make sure that the, um, that the nasal ala are monitored and the depth of the nasotracheal tube is recorded. So um, taping of the endotracheal tube can be, um, can be tricky, but you want to make sure that the nasal ala is exposed so that you can check it, um, preferably twice a day. Um, in order to make sure that that skin that's so sensitive is not breaking down. Secondly, we find it useful um, as far as monitoring the nasotracheal tube depth um, to put um, like a marker uh, mark on it um, so that you can make sure that that mark isn't migrating. If um, your endotracheal tube has markings as far as the how many centimeters it's at, um, which most do, um, you can also uh, monitor it that way. Um, these patients need NG tubes. If they don't have a G tube already for enteral feeding, we usually place those in the operating room. Um, and they'll need a post-operative KUB in order to check the placement of that, if that's something that your institution does as a standard. And these patients will need sedation for one week um, in the pediatric ICU with subsequent bronchoscopy. So um, older and calm, calm children may be awoken and mobilized early. Um, this is if they are able to tolerate nasotracheal, nasotracheal intubation um, and walk around and not be um, irritated by that. For double stage patients, these patients have a stent with the proline stay sutures um, with an air knot, air knot in the neck. I have diagrams later in this talk um, to, uh, to talk about taking that out. There's no need for sedation or paralysis in these patients, um, as the whole goal of the double stage is to not have them on the vent. Um, they do need a, um, an MBS to assess for aspiration, 
um, or a swallow study. Um, this is usually done um, whenever there has been a Loringo fissure um, to make sure that those vocal cords are closing properly and that it's safe for them to swallow. If they're awake enough, you could do this post-operative day one. You want to make sure it's communicated that the patient is not baggable or intubatable from above. Due to that superstomal stent, they are not going to be able to have any sort of manipulation above the trach, and the trach is their one airway. Um, so that is, it is essential to communicate this with the pediatric ICU team or anyone taking care of them. Finally, um, sometimes these young children have difficulty with managing their secretions and atropine drops can be useful um, for while the stent is in place or even afterwards. For cricotracheal resection, tracheal resection and slide um, tracheoplasty patients, um, you want to limit their neck extension. So um, we find that um, a zero mon monofilament uh, chin to chest suture is useful. Um, there are, um, you want to uh, maintain the, the head in a neutral position with this stitch and it's uncomfortable if you maintain the head in flexion actually, and so that's not recommended. Um, on post-operative day one, if they're extubated, you can always check for cord mobility with these, uh, after these procedures as the recurrent laryngeal nerves are at risk. You want to get an MVS while they're awake in order to make sure that it's safe for them to swallow. And um, finally, I would note that balloon dilation is actually not considered for their post-operative day seven bronchoscopy. And you don't want to consider this until six weeks um, following a slide tracheoplasty specifically. So we'll go over plans for post-operative bronchoscopy. Usually for airway reconstruction, you want to take a look at what things look like at about uh, one week. There's um, also an opportunity for two-week bronchoscopy. And again, this is just to check um, your graft placement, your anastomosis healing, and to make sure that there's no signs of infection or um, displacement and that you have a patent airway. For um, double stage tracheal reconstruction patients, they do not necessarily need to remain in the hospital um, for um, their oral sedation wean between one week bronch and their two week bronch because they were never on sedation to begin with, or they shouldn't have been rather. So here are some examples of some findings at the one week post-operative bronchoscopies for um, LTRs. So on your top left, um, if you have your single stage, this person had a posterior graft. Um, the 1.5 stage also had a posterior graft, and you can see the anterior graft as well. And the double stage also had a posterior and anterior graft, and this is just how they're healing. And it doesn't, you know, the um, double stage picture um, has a little bit of bleeding there, most likely irritation from, from the stent. So stent and tube management, um, of note, for a single stage patient, you want to wean the vent to extubate um, following this bronchoscopy. So um, when you take them back for their, for their post-operative day seven bronch, you can replace the endotracheal tube and they can be weaned from the vent and extubated in the pediatric ICU potentially the next day. So in order to wean the vent, you wanna make sure that certain parameters are met. So you only want to uh, want to extubate them when, when they are wide awake. So you want to make sure that their sedation is completely off. You want to have heliox available in case you need um, any adjuncts for um, their management. And CPAP we have found to be okay if it's administered at a low setting and we would consider this um, six centimeters of water or lower. As far as 1.5 staging, um, you'll extubate these patients in the operating room during the post update seven bronch, and you'll change their trach to a cuffed trach. And so then the vent can be weaned postoperatively and you can take that cuff down um, when they're ready. For a double stage um, procedure, the goal will be to remove that superstomal stent in the operating room during the postoperative day seven bronch. And this is how this goes. So these are some drawings um, showing that the air knot um, for that monofilament, monofilament suture will be on the right side of the incision. And so the goal here is to cut the air knot um, through the incision. It will be passing through an angiocath, which is situated in front of the trachea. 
And when you cut the air knot, that will release the stent from being held in place. Then you can take the stent out endoscopically through the mouth. So you use a big alligator to pull the stent out through the mouth once the knot is cut in a transcutaneous fashion. And this is an example of a moderate suprasternal granuloma um, after the stent removal. And we find that treating these with Cipridex is, um, is very helpful. So you can apply the Cipridex in the operating room and then continue nebulizations after that. Um, and those could be, um, those, should, those nebulizations should be through the mouth uh, or administered um, through a mask at the mouth. These are some examples of um, expected findings after um, two-week bronchoscopy for both, for um, single stage, one and a half stage, and double stage. And for laryngotracheal reconstruction, balloon dilation may be used as needed. So that's the end of our talk here, and we'll talk about complications in the next one.